Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wisconsin School Garden Network webinar on planting garlic and other fall garden tips. Um, we are really excited to have you here. We have many people from Wisconsin area and also from around the country. Um, today we'll be going over many examples and, and other tips today on um, you know how to care for your garden for the fall. And many of these tips are definitely applicable to other regions of the country, so we hope this will be helpful for everyone. We are broadcasting live from the Madison Lakeview Public Library, and we'll be recording this webinar today to make available for future use. Um, we'll be posting it to our website along with sending you, you a copy if you'd like to share with your colleagues and whatnot. As we go through the webinar, we'll be taking some questions. Um, and just so use your GoToMeetings control panel. There's a chat function, as maybe some of you have seen. Um, so feel free to ask any questions on that, and we'll be, we'll be answering them a couple of times throughout this webinar. Awesome. So um, I am Stephanie bugash Scopeline. I'm the Outreach Specialist at the Wisconsin School Garden Network. Um, this is a new network that was founded in April 1st, 2016, and we are a new statewide school garden network for early care education, after school programs, school gardens, and school garden support organizations. We help to serve at the state level as well as the, um, the local and regional level together. Um, we are working to, our goal of the network is to grow school gardens and school garden-based education, um, grow this movement for the health of all children. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jenica Skaug. I also work for Community Groundworks. I am the Goodman Youth Farm Manager. The Goodman Youth Farm is one of Community Groundworks Madison-based programs for youth garden-based education. And um, I've been with the Youth Farm now for about five years. I also um, did some work with the Wisconsin School Garden Initiative, the precursor to the network. Um, and at the Youth Farm, we have a half an acre garden space um, that we use for field trips and summer programs. Um, we involve the kids in hands-on uh, farm and garden-based education activities such as planting, harvesting, cooking, seed saving, beekeeping, um, and all sorts of other things um, that we uh, do on the farm every year from April through October. Awesome. So for today, we're going to be going over, um, fall, you know, part one is going to be basically talking about fun fall activities that you can do with um, kids and students in the garden. Um, we'll definitely be highlighting planting garlic and harvesting garlic. Um, we'll also be talking about how to plant some other perennials and some seed saving tips. And then part two is going to be just some general fall garden tips, you know, how to mulch your garden, um, what sort of cover crops you can use, along with different um, things that you can do with your compost, as well as some fruit tree um, specifics as well. Wonderful. Um, so we're going to start with um, garlic planting. This is one of the biggest things that we do in the fall. Um, I'm going to let Steph explain kind of the the basics of how to plant garlic, and then I'll give a few examples of how we do this at, with kids at the youth farm. Awesome. So like Jenica mentioned, um, fall planting of garlic is an awesome way to get the kids, you know, into the soil. Oftentimes, you know, people think, oh, it's it's getting fall, it's winter, you know, what can, what can we do with the kids in the garden? Well, planting garlic is an awesome way. Um, you can definitely still plant garlic as long as the ground hasn't completely frozen yet. Um, first thing that you will want to think about is what kind of variety of garlic to grow. We have soft neck versus hard neck. Um, basically, we like to use hard neck gar garlic just because it's uh, easier to harvest with the kids. Um, the necks, you know, aren't as, um, you know, as I said, are, are harder. So they're easier to, to harvest. They don't break as easily. They also grow larger bulbs, which is really exciting for the kids. And they, as well, they also have garlic scapes, which we'll, we'll touch on um, fun things to do with garlic scapes in a little bit. Um, on where to get your garlic, getting it from the local farmer's market is kind of the, the best practice that we have found 
Or if you have a neighbor that ha is, that grows garlic, you can certainly get um, cloves from them as well. One thing that we do mention is is not to just go get it from the grocery store, just because that won't be the best variety that will grow in in your region. So picking up some bulbs from the local farmers market is is awesome way to get some garlic. You can buy it online as well. Um, this can be a little bit expensive. Um, now that you have your bulbs, um, basically how you're going to start out, you're going to take take full bulbs, you'll separate them into the individual cloves, um, and you'll want to make sure that you're going to be planting the tip part up. Um, you'll want to make also make sure that you're you're planting it in, in six inch rows apart from one another. Um, as you're looking at the cloves, make sure that, you know, if there's any that are kind of looking a little discolored or withered, we're going to kind of pick the best cloves out of there to, to choose. In terms of um, your planting space, right, again, I mentioned six inches apart, and then you'll want to go bury it not too deep so that there's around one to two inches of soil above the tip of the garlic. Um, after you have planted your garlic, it's um, really important then to, to put some mulch over that, so like some straw or um, hay or leaves is a great resource. Um, Jenica will go into a little bit more specifics on um, you know, mulching in that process, but you can also check out, we have a, a newsletter that recently went out and that's on our website and has a, a lot more specific um, garlic planting guides and there's also some great um, regional stuff as well. Wonderful. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, planting garlic with students. At the youth farm, we plant garlic with students of pretty much any age from elementary school through high school. And we have developed a few basic techniques that make the garlic planting a little bit easier to facilitate with those ages of, of kids. Um, so we start by um, making sure we outline where our bed is. If you are at a place where you have raised beds, that's going to be really easy for you. Um, and then we kind of line all the kids up along the side of the bed so that everyone can see. And um, we always do a demonstration before we plant. Um, in the place where we're going to plant, we start off by making a row or a trench or a furrow. We try to dig it about four inches deep um, and so that the soil underneath is still a little bit squishy. Um, you, you're going for, you know, having a place where you can push that garlic into the ground a little bit so it stands up straight um, and um, but that you can still cover it with one to two inches of soil above the tip of the garlic. Um, so how we facilitate that is um, we lay out a measuring tape or a planting rope, um, which is just a rope with little flags on it wherever we want uh, a garlic clove to go. Um, and we have each kit give each child a trowel and we explain the difference between a hole and a furrow um, with a furrow being more like we, we always explain it as a river and you have to work to to join your end of the river with your neighbor's end of the river um, and, and the kids then have to work together to do that. Um, then we take away the trowels so they don't become a distraction and we talk a little bit about the garlic plant and how it grows. It's really great if you have a whole garlic plant with the leaves still attached, even if they're dry from last season to show the kids how the plant grew last year. Um, and then we talk about breaking up the, the bulb into separate cloves um, so that kids can really see which end of the garlic clove came from last year's um, root. Um, and that part needs to go down in the soil. Um, so we have them help us with splitting apart the bulbs. Sometimes that's a little challenging um, if you have hard neck garlic. So kids might need help or taking out that first clove, and then it's usually pretty easy for them. You want to make sure not to take off the skin that's surrounding each clove. Um, and then um, we, ha we show them how to plant it. Um, so we stick it straight down with the root scar into the soil. Um, and with our planting rope system, uh, they are sticking one garlic at each flag. Um, at the youth farm, we do ours 12 inches apart, um, and that's a really easy spacing for us. Um, we find that, you know, when you get plant them closer together, six inches, sometimes um, it's it's just harder to to get that spacing exactly right. So with especially with little kids, we use the wider spacing, and we tend to grow bigger garlic, which is nice. Um, and so the, the secret then 
uh, once you hand out the cloves and begin planting is that nobody covers their cloves until everybody has planted all of them. And that gives you and the kids a chance to double check your work. Make sure all the garlic cloves are facing the right direction. And if they're not, then you can fix them and that you have the right spacing. Then everybody covers all their cloves together um, for that row. I, oh, and then <laughs> the last step is mulching your garlic. Um, so at the youth farm, we use um, straw or hay. We actually, it's actually marsh hay that we order um, from a local farmer. Um, but you could also use uh, leaves. We recommend not using oak leaves or pine needles because they're high in acid. Um, you could also use grass clippings um, if you don't have a good source of straw or hay, as long as you make sure that it's not grass that has been sprayed with um, chemicals of any kind. And the, the key to mulching the garlic is you want to do it pretty thick. Um, with the straw or hay, it tends to fluff up. Um, so I always uh, say you want it to go for four to six inches of mulch once the mulch has settled. Um, but usually the, the volume decreases by at least half um, from the time when you mulch it to the uh, after it's settled, which happens in about one to two weeks. So sometimes I like to go back and check after we've done the mulching um, and just see, does that area need more mulch? You can see the bed on the right is one that the wind came and took some of it, and we did go back and, and fill in a few of those holes afterwards. Another good idea, especially if you're using leaves, is to find some large sticks or other heavy objects that are, are long, maybe sticks with branches, to kind of hold those down until they get rained and snowed upon um, to keep the wind from blowing them away. Um, and then you can remove those in the spring. Um, but the kids really love to help with the mulching. Um, and you can talk about how it protects the garlic over the winter. Great. The next step in your garlic is a really fun thing to do with kids go out in the early spring when temperatures are starting to get up into the upper 40s or, fi or low 50s during the day because your garlic may start to emerge in Wisconsin. Um, that usually happens for us uh, depending on the year between mid-March and mid-April. Uh, this is a picture of uh, what the garlic looks like when it's first coming up with some varieties. Um, if you've mulched very thickly, you may need to move the mulch aside to help the garlic find the light. Other varieties um, will do that on their own. Um, and it's a really exciting time for kids to come out into the garden before anything else is growing and um, see the results. Um, at the youth farm, we also plant a lot of green garlic. Um, and what this is, is it's simply garlic that we harvest early. We can harvest it as early as um, April or May here in Wisconsin. And um, you could harvest garlic, any garlic this way. Um, but what we like to do at the youth farm is instead of planting a single clove, we like to plant the entire bulb. It's, this works especially well if you have a bulb that's a little bit small um, for cutting up and eating. Um, and then when it starts to grow, it grows very much like a bunching onion. All, each clove will grow a little sprout. And because they're all close together, um, they'll stay fairly small and tender throughout the spring season. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's really fun to harvest for the kids, the first thing they can get and eat out of the garden. Um, and then we usually use it um, in cooking activities. You could use green garlic in any recipe where you would use garlic. It's just a little bit more mild. Um, but one of our favorite recipes is green garlic pesto. We use green garlic, um, the, the white stock and the green leaf um, mixed with some Parmesan cheese and olive oil. Um, salt. Um, we usually don't use nuts because of so many allergies. Um, and this picture also shows that um, it can be a little spicy for some kids. So we, we put a little ricotta cheese under there to help with the, the spiciness. And it's usually a big hit um, at the youth farm. Awesome. So as your garlic is um, continuing to grow throughout the spring months, we get to the June months where um, garlic scapes will start to develop. Basically, um, garlic scapes are um, typically ready around to harvest around the second to third week of June, and they are 
basically the flowering bud of the garlic. Um, but it's really, really fun to go through the, 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 the garden with the kids um, and find these, these sort of bulbs and snap them off. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a fun scavenger hunt that you can do. Um, these garlic scapes are great for cooking. Um, we can also at the, at the youth farm, they like to pickle them as well. We once had a kid um, whose mom came, the mom came to the, the farm and mentioned that, um, you know, I've been trying to get my kid to eat garlic scapes for years, but they, they just wouldn't eat it. But he came home the other day and, and was super excited because they ate pickled garlic scapes at the farm. Um, so that's a, a fun way to get the kids engaged and, um, you know, fun, another thing that you can do with the garlic. Um, if you are, are not able to harvest the garlic scapes with um, the students, it is a good idea for if you can get a volunteer or, or someone that's managing the garden space to go out and, and do kind of snap these off, though, in, in, the, in the June time, because um, it is something that will take those nutrients away from um, the bulbs. And it, it will kind of help if you snap them off, it'll help to develop a bigger bulb and, and, and get that nice, thick, thick bulb that we know garlic to be. Now it's time to harvest. So we're looking at these kind of two different photos. We have the photo on the left here is um, a photo taken in around early July. We can see that the, the leaves are still pretty green, um, but the photo on the right is a more withered. Um, those leaves are definitely more withered. They're a little more brown. Um, and basically this is that garlic that is ready to harvest. Um, a good trick with the kids um, when harvesting that garlic is making sure that we demonstrate, like Jenica talked about, gen demonstrating um, how to harvest first so that they don't accidentally uh, skewer one of those garlic bulbs. So we want to make sure, you know, when we're using those digging forks, um, which is an awesome way to, to harvest the garlic, that you're around six inches away from the actual bulb of the plant. And then you can just, um, you know, step into that and then dig that garlic right up. Again, um, making sure to demonstrate first, just because otherwise you'll get some bruised garlic um, or some that are skewered right through. Um, another tip too is it's really good to harvest um, the garlic when the soil is semi dry. If it's if it's really wet, it will get it'll get a uh, pretty muddy. So wanting making sure that um, the soil is, is semi dry is is a really good way to harvest. Um, when you are harvesting as well, you want to make sure you don't want to cut off the roots or the tops. Um, as well as not washing the garlic. Um, this will really help to cure it, to preserve it for um, the future. So just keep those roots, on, those roots and the stalks on. This is um, one example of some garlic that we have hung up in our kids' garden. Um, basically, once, once you've harvested that garden or the garlic, um, you can preserve it in many different ways. This is a, a really easy way. Um, basically what you're looking for is a nice dry space um, with lots of good airflow. Um, another option is to lay it out on a screen as well. Um, when you do hang it up like this, you're just going to want to make sure that you wrap that rope really tight just because the, the, the stalks will shrivel a little bit and then you know your garlic will all come out. So just make sure you tie it really, really tight um, when you are hanging it up. One thing, this is uh, Jenica again, one thing I forgot to mention is um, the youth farm has the luxury of being a, a very large garden. Um, I know a lot of schools have much smaller spaces. Um, so a question that I get at the youth farm a lot is, how can I do this activity when I have one raised bed and, you know, 100 students or 30 students that all need to be involved? Um, you know, I always think of my job at the youth farm as trying to take uh, an activity a garden activity that would take one adult half an hour and try to split it up so that 20 kids can all do it at the same time in 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> and so I think just kind of applying that mentality to your own garden space um, will kind of, you know, take you pretty far in designing an activity that will work for your school. Um, I, I had one uh, gardener, school gardener in Madison, she had a four by six raised bed to plant with her garlic and she had um, probably over a hundred students that were coming out throughout the course of the day in um, different classes. So one class would come for half an hour and the next class would come for half an hour. And what she did is she marked where the garlic was going to go with popsicle sticks because it was a small space. 
the kids would come out, they would plant the garlic, um, and then they would go back in. And she had a 10 minute break between each class. She would dig up all the garlic, <laughs> and the next class would come out and plant the garlic again. She did that the whole day, um, which was obviously a lot of extra work. Um, but then every child got the experience of planting that garlic, um, which was obviously really important for their school. And at the end of the day, all the garlic got planted. <laughs> So now we will um, take time for some questions. So if anybody has have any, you know, has any questions about um, garlic or things, um, you know, issues that you've run into in the past or anything fun to share as well in terms of programs that maybe you've done with planting garlic, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Well, if not, we'll uh, move on to kind of our next section and feel free to always, you know, ask questions in that chat and we'll continue to answer them. Um, next sort of thing, this is just more fun um, fall things that you can do with students. Um, another great thing to plant in the fall time is those perennial um, flowers. So these are some tulip bulbs. Um, tulips can be an awesome um, way to engage the kids. Again, those another fall planting thing to do. Um, you can scatter them all throughout your garden or plant them in a huge bunch. Um, they are perennial, so they will come back each. They will come back each year, and it, these are really fun as well because it's another early thing for the the kids to see in the garden that they can go out and engage with. Um, this will also help with pollinators, um, bringing in that it's a good source of early food for the pollinators as well, and it just kind of gives that spark to that garden, um, also. So I love to sprinkle these around my gar my um, the garden space, and it's kind of a fun scavenger hunt for the kids again to kind of see where are the tulips gonna where are the tulips gonna pop up, and sometimes they'll remember where they planted them, and so they will run over and check in on those um, those those two those bulbs to see if they've sprouted yet or whatnot. It's really fun way to kind of engage engage the kids. One thing to keep in mind is that daffodil bulbs before they flower look very similar to green garlic. It is possible to tell the difference, but uh, if you're planting them nearby, you may want to mark which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So another fall thing to do with your kids in the in the garden is um, planting, making having um, fall vegetables available. Um, we have kale here as well as, um, so the, the right side photo is a bunch of kale that we're growing as well as some Brussels sprouts and some broccoli. And so these are all fall, um, fall crops that you could plant um, that will harden off through the winter. Depending on what region you are, some of these may even last all throughout the winter. I know that um, I have a friend in Baltimore who is currently continuing to harvest their kale and will continue to until around December or January even. So um, one thing that's special about these plants as well is that actually with a light frost, um, it will actually make the, the plants sweeter. So I know that there are some farmers that won't even harvest these fall vegetables until um, there's a little bit of a frost because it helps to the higher rate of, photo, um, it's a higher rate of photosynthesis that then uh, triggers the plant to produce more sugar, which makes these vegetables even sweeter, which is pretty fun. Um, you can harvest, like I said, these into November, December, and in some um, cases all the way till that snow is falling. So if you want to look up, you know, your local um, extension agent, you can find kind of region specifics, but for the most part, these crops should still be producing way into November, December. I have uh, two fun stories about um, fall harvesting. The first is about Brussels sprouts. Um, Brussels sprouts, I feel like, have this reputation, especially among kids, of being the yucky vegetable. I know um, when I grew up, we, we never even ate Brussels sprouts. We just heard about how gross they were. Um, and so I had this mission of trying to change kids' minds <laughs> about Brussels sprouts. Uh, and so one year I decided I was going to do roasted Brussels sprouts with an entire fifth grade class, which was about 50 kids. Um, it was two classes. Um, and so we're lucky enough that we had, uh, you know, kind of a row of Brussels sprouts. And um, so we lined all the kids up. Um, and we showed them how to snap off a Brussels sprout with their thumb off of the stem. So we had each kid snap off one or two Brussels sprouts, just like walking down the edge of the garden. And then we walked them uh, in their line straight into our outdoor kitchen. And they put their their Brussels sprouts down onto um, some foil packets. 
Uh, and we also put some garlic in there because we were actually planting garlic that day as well. We wrapped them up and put them on the fire and they roasted for 45 minutes to an hour while we did the rest of our field trip. And at the end, they were the most beautiful caramelized Brussels sprouts. Um, and every kid asked for seconds. Um, and then uh, this was a school that comes back every year. So then the next year's fifth graders had even heard from the previous year's fifth graders that these Brussels sprouts are so good. So now I don't actually have to do any more convincing about Brussels sprouts. Every generation of fifth graders from the school knows that the Brussels sprouts are the best snack at the youth farm. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh Kale, I also have a story. We have kids that just go crazy for kale. Um, so one year I was doing a winter program in a classroom in December, and I went out to the youth farm, and I, I actually harvested some kale under about six inches of snow. And I took a picture of it before I harvested it. Um, and then we made it into the classroom. We made kale chips. Um, and it was really neat to show the kids the picture of the kale before that morning before it had gotten to their classroom. A lot of them were really amazed. And if you're lucky enough to have your kids right at school um, in the winter, um, taking them outside to do some of that harvesting can be really fun. Awesome. So the next thing that we can also harvest well into November and December are herbs. Um, this is kind of a, a mishmash of herbs taken from one of our gardens, but um, these these plants are very hardy as well, and they can be harvested well into December. Um, one of the fun things that you can do with kids is make um, mint and lemon balm tea. Um, you can also um, use, you know, if you have some dill left over, you can grab some dill and make some pickles, maybe some some cucumbers, maybe at the from the farmer's market or the grocery store or whatnot. Um, another fun thing is you can make some soap. So if you have lavender or rosemary, um, herbs are always great for cooking. So you can, you know, have the kids collect the herbs and then make little herb bunches and maybe they could hang them up to dry and potentially take them home to cook with. And so that's just kind of a great way to bring that garden, you know, into the home and kind of um, inspire, you know, maybe kids to grow gardens at their own home. Pickled kale is very popular at the youth farm this summer. Uh, <laughs> we do everything with kale because it's one of the only plants that just keeps growing and growing and growing. <laughs> um, so I just want to talk a little bit about a few of the other activities um, that we do at the youth farm in the fall. It's a really fun time of year because we're not only bringing in the harvest, um, you know, that's that's from our spring plantings and our summer plantings, um, we are also preparing for next year. So one of the things um, that combines those two activities is seed saving. Uh, here's a couple of pictures. We grew a bean teepee this year of dry beans, um, mostly scarlet runner beans, but we also grow a, an entire bed specifically of different varieties of dry beans. Um, and once the pods start to um, become brown, and we call them old grandpa beans, um, we have the kids go in and pick big handfuls of those and bring them back to a picnic table. Um, the next picture, here we go, shows, uh, do you want to go to the next picture, Stephanie? Right. So this is a picture of the kids sorting the beans, opening the pods and sorting the beans into their different categories. Um, we have to get the varieties mixed up and have the kids sort them out. It's a great activity for kindergarten, first and second graders, especially. Um, we talk about the life cycle of the plant and how we can save the seeds to plant them again in the spring. Um, sometimes we practice counting them into seed packets, um, and then we, we give those seed packets away either to the school or we have a little free seed library that we put them in. Um, sometimes we like to use living plates from the garden so the seeds don't fall through the picnic table. Um, these were old believe they were collard green leaves that were just bug eaten and not as good anymore, but they were really great for this purpose. And the kids guys that keep those and take them home. Um, we also uh, like to save sunflower seeds are great to save with kids um, or ah. um, tomato seeds are fun as well. Tomatoes are, um, I'll take a little bit yeah. more um, time to save. Um, and, you know, out in the garden, a tomato will fall down onto the ground with and herbs, it will rot. And if you've ever opened a tomato to eat it, you know that the seeds are kind of encased in, in this little bit of gelatin um and and so to to make them so that you can put them in a seed packet you need them to go through that rotting process they would go through in the garden that breaks down that gelatin around each seed um and so what i like to do is squish the tomato juices and seeds into a jar um 
and then let that sit for two to three days, depending on the temperature. It gets pretty rotty and stinky, <laughs> um, but it's it's neat for the kids to look at and imagine that as a tomato on the ground. At the end of that time, you dump the jar into a mesh strainer and run some water over it, and you'll end up with your your plain seeds. They'll be wet. Then you need to kind of lay them out on a piece of paper towel or a paper plate. Um, and let them dry for a couple more days. And then you'll have the nice fuzzy tomato seeds that you see um, when you open your seed packet. Awesome. So now we're going to um, answer a question from um, Janine who asked, um, when do you want to plant the Brussels sprouts? Um, in Wisconsin and Madison, we usually plant them in mid to late May. They grow all season. Um, and in I would say late August to early September, we do something called topping, where you you cut off the growing tip of the Brussels sprouts, just those, those few leaves that are right on the top, and that helps to send a signal to the plant um, that it's time to stop growing upwards and put more energy into the sprouts. At that point, you should be able to see kind of small sprouts forming, um, but if you top it over the next month and a half, you'll see those sprouts get much larger and, and look like that picture that we showed. Awesome. So now we're going to move on to just some general fall garden um, tips on, you know, things to take care of, kind of help your garden um, overwinter well. Um, one of those things is, you know, if you have any drip irrigation in place, you're definitely going to want to pull pull out that drip irrigation, um, put away any hoses, make sure there isn't any water in them so they don't freeze and then potentially could break. Um, if you have any signs around your garden, like this awesome kale sign that we have, um, it's good to take down those signs just so that, you know, through the harsh winter, you don't lose the fun color that the that the kids have put into it. Um, this is also an awesome time to reorganize your tool shed um, if this is, you know, something you find enjoyable. But it's a good time to take inventory and, and see what else you might need for, um, for the next year. Um, you know, making things mice-proof. So if you have any things that are cloth or paper, it might be good idea to either put them in really um, sturdy bins or bring them inside um, just so that you don't walk into the um, in the springtime and have a kind of a, a mice a mice home. Um, the other great recommendation that we have for the fall is covering your garden. So making sure we cover that that soil is is really, really key. Um, if this is one thing that you um, decide to do for the fall, I think it would definitely be covering that garden space. Um, some really good, this is, um, we have two kind of examples here. The one on the left is um, a covering of um, straws. They did, they put all their, their beds um, they had a nice layer of straw mulch over all of their beds. They also have some leaves in this corner here. And as Jenica mentioned, making sure we're just staying away from oak leaves um, as well as pine needles. But you can use leaves um, or straw just to give a nice blanket on that soil to protect it from the harsh winter. Another option is you could use cardboard as well. And that's kind of an easy, you know, if you have a bunch of boxes that come through the school or, you know, to your house or whatnot, um, you can use cardboard to cover up those beds. Um, it is a good idea. The cardboard will fly away. So like Jenica mentioned as well, you know, putting some sticks over it or maybe you'll put some straw on top of the cardboard. Um, to kind of weigh it down, you can use some poles also. I have seen people use, use tarps as well. So you have a, if you have a smaller garden, maybe tarps are a little more reasonable. So you could um, add tarps as well as grass clippings. Um, all of those things, you know, could be fun kind of, a, again, you know, having the kids help out in terms of finding other, finding other things to kind of cover that, that garden bed with. Another fall, um, another fall task to do could be taking care of your your herbs um, and to m help them kind of overwinter again. You'll want to to cut them back. You know, if this doesn't happen, it's not the biggest um, you know the end of the world or whatnot. But it's kind of helpful in this fall if you have some more time. Um, again, with the you could do this with the kids and kind of cutting those herbs back just so that they're you're not going to take out the entire plant, but cut them back so they're closer to the ground and. Um, keeping those root systems intact. Um, this slide shows kind of a before and after of um, cutting back those herbs as well as then adding some leaf mulch. So we added some leaf mulch around the herbs to kind of protect them. You know, we have some more delicate, um, not as 
not as many herbs are as hardy as others. And so if we want that lavender or that rosemary to, to overwinter, um, putting some, some leaf mulch around there, some straw um, is a really helpful way to kind of ensure that they will um, come through the winter. Strawberries, this is a fun, um, this is our strawberry bed as well. And um, if you are planting, you know, if you have strawberries, they're also a perennial, so they will come back the next year. Um, but you can also give that a nice layer of mulch. Um, just make sure it's not too, too thick because then the um, daughters um, won't come back the next um, spring. So a nice light layer of mulch will, again, also help ensure that they will um, survive that winter. Wonderful. So this time of year, if it's still um, warm-ish in your region, you can spread some cover crops. If it's uh, like Wisconsin and you're entering into the nights in the 20s and days in the 30s, um, you may want to wait until spring to do this activity. Um, but cover cropping is, uh, if you're not familiar, um, spread it, scattering seeds in an area that will grow and then won't be harvested. Instead, we'll let the plants die or we will um, cut them down and mix them into the soil. Some people call it a green manure or a living compost. Um, those plants help to add nutrients back into the soil as well as organic matter. So this is a great thing to do to help keep down weeds or if you have um, somewhat poor soil to um, enrich it or even if you're growing in the same space year after year. Um, some of the favorite cover crops that we use at the youth farm in the cooler weather um, usually in late August to mid-September for planting or in the early spring, April and early May, is a mixture of oats and field peas. You can order these from many different seed catalogs um, and the peas add nitrogen and the oats also help to hold the soil in place. You can even eat the the little green pea shoots, which is a really fun activity to pick off the tips from the cover crop area. It's a great introduction to talking about cover crop. Um, and then we often have the kids help us to spread the seeds, <laughs> um, usually one handful at a time, um, and then rake them into the soil. Um, and then uh, watering them would be another great activity for kids. If it's over a large area, we sometimes use a sprinkler or hope that it rains. <laughs> um, there are definitely other cro cover crops that you can use if you're in the middle of summer and you want to plant a cover crop. Um, buckwheat is a good choice. Um, both buckwheat and oats and peas will die in the if it's a, a very hard freeze um, and then remain on top of your garden as a dry mulch um, over the winter. So they're a little bit easier um, than other cover crops because you don't have to cut them down on your own. Uh, and then here's a picture of our oats and peas that we planted uh, this year in late September. This picture was taken and in late October. So this is after a month of, of growth. You can see that with the kids spreading the seeds, we did have a few bare spots in the soil, um, but overall it was a pretty good um, spreading of the seeds. Oh, and you want to mix the oats and peas. It's the ratio of two two peas to one oats approximately. <laughs> awesome. So another fall task that you can do that's good for um, your garden in the area is to um, do some maintenance. This is an awesome time to do some maintenance on your compost. So if you have a compost pile, um, this is a great opportunity to add some browns to it. So things like straw or leaves or um, dried out grass clippings are great. Um, this is basically... You know, if you haven't had a chance to turn the pile yet, um, maybe, you know, maintenance has gotten away from you. This is a, it's a good chance to, to add a bunch of straw or leaves, like I said, some brown materials to that pile. Give it a nice turn and then place a nice, um, nice high layer of that straw or um, mulch over the top of that pile just to, to help it kind of um, insulate itself as well as, um, you know, once in the spring comes, they'll start that that breaking down process kind of right away. Um, this is a photo from our Goodman farm, some people collecting some straw or hay to, to then go and put on, to put on their compost pile. Another activity that we do with compost in the fall at the youth farm is we, if we have finished compost that's still available from last year's pile, we have the kids sift it 
Um, so we have little um, bucket-sized compost sifters. They fit on top of a five-gallon bucket. We talk about the process of composting and how it uh, benefits our garden. Um, and then we have the kids um, scoop the finished compost, um, which often still does have wood chips and sticks in it, um, in, into their on top of their buckets. And they love love, love the sifting process. Any child ages, I think 4K, up, even up through sixth grade, we've done this activity and they're always excited to see what's in the compost and then kind of challenge themselves as how much they can sift. And then we put that straight onto our garden, either um, with our garlic planting, or we often like to put it on our asparagus patch um, and our raspberry patch. Those are areas that need um, extra compost added every year. Great. Um, if your garden has fruit trees, um, this is another activity that you'll want to do in the late fall. Um, this can be done really anytime as soon as the cooler weather starts to hit. Sometimes we've done it as late as mid-November here. Um, and so one of the things that you'll want to do is protect the trunk of the young trees, uh, especially for trees that are one, two, three-ish years old. That bark can be really sensitive to sunburn from reflections off of the snow in the winter, as well as chewing from small animals, rabbits, etc. Um, so you can get several types of tree wrap. This is a, a paper version. There's plastic versions. Um, you want to wrap that up. And we also put fencing around the trees, um, depending on your area and what um, winter animals are common. Um, you may choose a shorter fence like chicken wire. Um, if you're mostly worried about like rabbits, if you're worried about deer, you might choose a, a taller, taller fence um, and a wider girth to keep those deer from chewing on the trunk and branches. Um, we also tend to put in uh, a stake or two. We use the metal T posts, um, and then from that stake, we use some plastic twine um, to help stabilize the tree. Um, when you're going up around the the trunk wherever that twine is touching the trunk you want to use something that's going to um, spread out the force of the twine a little bit and not dig into the driver's the license so um, we use old bike tire or old pieces of garden hose like glass um, you can buy specific things but um, I, I just really like to use what is available um, so if you have those things um, that works wonderfully and um the last thing we try to do uh, over the winter is add some wood chip mulch around the base of the tree um, pretty thickly, and we, we kind of form it like a volcano so that you're not putting that mulch um, right next to the trunk of the tree. Um, you kind of have that crater in the middle, and then it goes in a big heap around the, the edge. Awesome. So this is um, kind of coming to the end of our webinar here. We want to take the chance, though, to make sure um, if people have any questions, that they have the opportunity to ask any questions, or if people want to put into the chat, you know, some other fun fall garden ideas that you do with kids or other fun um, or good tasks to help kind of the garden for the fall, we invite you to kind of add that in here. Um, but if not, we want to thank you all for um, coming. You know, we'll wait a little bit to, to let those questions come in. If you do have any questions. I'll share um, while, while we're waiting to see if there's any questions. Um, another fun activity that we, we love to do at the youth farm in the fall, and you can really do this activity almost any time of the year, um, but it's, it's so colorful in the fall, is we do a lot of food art at the youth farm. So we'll harvest different vegetables, um, sometimes we have the kids harvest them and sometimes if we have a shorter amount of time, we'll, we'll kind of pre-harvest a few things. We practice chopping in the kitchen and then, um, we'll have the kids make either a two dimensional piece of art, like a, like a picture of a face or an animal on, on their plate or even on a collard green leaf. Um, and then they get to eat their art creation, which I think is really fun. With older kids, we get out toothpicks and we make three-dimensional creations that they can take home and show their families. Um, I even had a parent contact me this year and say that her her second grade daughter went on a field trip to the youth farm and brought home her food art and was enthusiastically telling her mom all about 
uh, the different pieces that were used in that food art. Um, and, and I think it cl- included a purple, purple radish. And she said, yeah, I don't even know there was a purple radish, but my daughter was so excited about it. Um, so it can really create some cool connections to get kids excited about the, the food. All right. Well, we want to thank you again for your time. Um, as you know, if you have any questions or anything else, um, to ask us our, here are our emails, um, or you can go to visit our website, um, which is located at the bottom, um, for more resources or upcoming events. Um, we want to thank you again for your time and hope you enjoyed our webinar.